What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hetnes, and it is my mission to help you to make workshops work. And today with me on the show is Wayne Turmel. He's a leadership consultant, the author of several fiction and nonfiction books, and he's the co-founder of Remote Leadership Institute. So today we're going to speak about how to make virtual workshops work. Stay tuned. Rain, hello. Yes, hello. Welcome to the show. Workshops thank work. You. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking time. And I'm excited to talk about virtual workshops and virtual meetings and how to make them work. Good. Because that's yeah. what I came prepared to talk about. So that and I've works been out on nicely. a quest. I've been on a quest for quite a while already to find out how to make virtual workshops work. And then I came across, I think, another podcast recording with you. And I thought, finally, I found the person who can answer all my questions. And I'm sure that the audience is also more than curious. That's why I'm here. You know, as somebody who started in this game a, <laughs> a while ago, live workshops are what got me into the training business. And I still love them more than anything because put me in front of a live audience and I'm a happy boy. But when we started doing, when the world started doing virtual workshops and webinars and whatever we called them at the time, very few people were actually focused on making the transition. Mm -hmm. And that's always been something of a hobby horse of mine is why does somebody who's terrific in the front of a classroom, mm -hmm. somebody who has all the facilitation skills and uh, charisma and all the things that do make for a good workshop trainer, why do they struggle when they move online? And so this has always been kind of a subtext to my work over the last few years. So what is it? What is this magic ingredient or magic skill that a facilitator needs? It's not magic. But I think, and I with me, it, it, it's not magic. <laughs> This is the thing. It's actually what happens to most good classroom trainers when they make the, the move to a virtual workshop is we find ourselves in the same position that our learners find themselves. And if we wonder why our learners get cranky and don't get with the program and don't perhaps learn as fast as they might, This is our chance to earn a little empathy because what happens, I believe, mm -hmm. is that many of us who go into live classroom facilitation, we have this gene that unlike most human beings, we actually like being at the front of the room. We enjoy the interaction. We mm -hmm. enjoy public speaking, certainly more than the average person mm -hmm. does. And because we've been doing it most of our lives in one form or another, a lot of classroom trainers have performing backgrounds or they were singers or they were in whatever. I mean, we've been doing or this and, and, or comedians <laughs> and we go into the business because it allows us to play on a strength. What happens when we move online is we take away the part of the job we like Mm. which is hearing the laughter, seeing the smiles, getting the feedback. And we add a component which was never there before, which is suddenly we are consciously incompetent. And we've That's been true. training for mm -hmm. so long and speaking in public and doing all that good stuff, we're not used to being in that position. Mm -hmm. And in order to become a good virtual facilitator, we need to get over that hump of getting out of our own head. Does this make sense? Totally. The way that I'm explaining this? So what happens is instead of being the smartest person in the room, we are suddenly filled with self-doubt and second guessing and we're inside our own head and we're trying to remember which button to push and I just told my best joke and I have no idea if they liked it. <laughs> Because you don't have the visual clue. Because even if you get the visual cue, it's just not the same. Mm -hmm. And so we are in our own heads and we know because we are with learners all day long who are in their own heads and we're trying to get them out of it. There are some things that we can do 
to get over that hump, but we have to get over that hump. Mm -hmm. So what would be your advice? I think there are two things, and this, this sounds simple, and I know that it's not easy. So when I say this, don't look at me and go, yeah, okay, Wayne. <laughs> but there are two things. The first thing is we have to remember that we know how to facilitate. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, when they start presenting online, they forget the basic rules, mm. right? We are used to delivering webinars. If you told somebody in a classroom, I'm going to talk for about, oh, 45 minutes or so, and I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff, and I'm not going to look at you, and I don't want you to look at me, and I want you to save your questions for the end. <laughs> I think I got your point. <laughs> right? Yeah, that is yeah. literally the opposite of <laughs> what we should do. And that's why so many just zone out when they're in front of webinars, me included, I have to admit. Well, yeah. that's why we're very conscious when we're, we do webinars, but they're primarily marketing events. Yeah. You know, I'm going to talk about a topic and we have 100, 200 people on the line and it's one way and everybody knows how that game is played. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I will not do is refer to that as training because we know that we need to deliver information in small chunks. We need to engage our audience. We know all this. I mean, if you asked a trainer, if you were going to do a two-hour module on leading virtual meetings, mm -hmm. what would that look like? They could tell you exactly what that looks like. You want to do some assessment. You want to do some checking in as you go. You want to give people a chance to play and push the buttons. Okay, do that. <laughs> yeah. So the first thing I think that we absolutely have to remember is that we know what good training looks like. We know what facilitates learning. We know what the transfer of learning should be like. Do that. <laughs> so that, that's the first part. The second part, though, of course, is why don't smart, capable people do that? Mm -hmm. And that's the part where we need to get out of our heads a bit. A couple of interesting statistics. One is that 75% of WebEx users receive no training in the tool. It's here's your WebEx license, try not to hurt somebody. And so most of us never really learned how to use it effectively. We've seen it used, we've played with it. And like most people, we use the minimum amount of the technology in order to accomplish what we think we need to accomplish. The second statistic is that 80% of people use 20% of the features mm -hmm. of these tools. And so if I don't really understand the tool and I'm not comfortable using it, and I don't use it to its full effect, odds are I'm not going to be terribly effective. Mm -hmm. And so there are a couple of things that need to happen. But the primary thing is that there's a learning curve that cannot be avoided when you're learning to use these tools. And the analogy that I always use is learning to drive a car, mm -hmm. right? If you're driving in your car, and it's raining, and it's pouring out, and it's dark, and you're in a neighborhood that you've never been in before, and you're trying to find a street address, what do you do? You turn down the radio so you can see better. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous, right? What does the volume of the... Because our brains can only process so much, and we tend we to eliminate dis distractions. Distraction, exactly, yeah. When I'm teaching a class, and I'm focused on my content, and I'm trying to do this, and I have to push too many buttons and I have to look at the chat while I'm looking at the screen, while I'm checking my PowerPoint notes, while I'm doing that, it's too much, especially for people who are used to doing all this on autopilot. Mm -hmm. The thing is, there's no way to get over that hump. You have to do that. But the good news is it only takes about six or seven times, mm -hmm. which means you have to practice live. You have to get on the platform and you have to practice being able to do that. Because if you think about when you were learning to drive a car, your hands were at 10 and 2, you were checking the mirror, you're checking the dashboard, you're checking your... You're hyper aware of everything and you're not a very good driver. I mean, you're and, and technically... you didn't start alone. 
and you, you always had someone off. next to you who would make sure that you right. don't kill yourself or anyone. Which kind of gets to the point. While the odds of anybody during a web-based meeting, actual fatalities are very rare. <laughs> Luckily. So the stakes are a little lower. But we have the same reaction. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll give you a, a classic example. I can't tell you how many trainers say, oh, I hate when people use the chat mm -hmm. because it's distracting. I'm trying to focus on doing my thing and there's words popping up in mm -hmm. the screen and I find it very distracting. A couple of things about that. First of all, if you get really used to this, if you do this enough times, it's not a big deal. It's like driving and checking your rear view mirror. You mm -hmm. can do it out of the side of your eye and I know people don't believe me, but it's true. So that's one thing, right? The second thing is chat in a virtual classroom is invaluable. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly useful. And if you are removing that as an option or discouraging people from using that, you're actually limiting the interaction and engagement of your yeah. learners. Now, to your point about not being alone, I facilitate... I'm, Matter of fact, as soon as I'm done speaking to you, I've got a workshop later this morning, and I'm doing that one by myself. I've literally written the book <laughs> on, on how to do this. I can do it. It's also, it's a client that I know before. It's content that I've seen before. Mm. It's not a and, and you're experienced. I mean, and we drive cars by ourselves now, hopefully. But Hopefully, started... and soon the cars will be driving us, <laughs> exactly. which is going to make it even easier. But that's the point, is I've been doing this literally since WebEx began. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned before that we tend to use only 20% of the features. Mm -hmm. So according to you, what is the most underused feature? Well, there are two. One of them, as I say, is the chat. We encourage people, rightly so, use your webcam, have your microphone open if you must be on mute mm -hmm. and jump in. But not everybody, especially when we work internationally, is comfortable just chiming in and speaking up. Mm -hmm. Right? If we're in a classroom, I can see somebody is quiet, but by the expression on their face, they have a question. If I'm on a virtual meeting and I say, so who's got a question? Odds are it's the same two or three people that are going to be doing all the speaking. Chat allows the introverts and especially those with English as a second language mm. a chance to participate. If I'm in an international group and every time I say something, the American instructor says, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your accent. Can you say <laughs> that again? At some point, I'm just going to quit contributing. Because most people who are working in a different language, their written English is better than their spoken English, mm -hmm. they may want to formulate the question or formulate their statement in writing and hit send as a way of contributing effectively. If I'm discouraging people from chat, I'm asking them not to do that. So the chat is one piece. The other one is, it's really funny, I, I say to people all the time, Okay, so if you were, when they're skeptical about virtual classroom, I say, so what would you do in a real classroom, real classroom, mm -hmm. that you can't do online? Well, I'd ask for a show of hands. You know there's a button right there that says raise hand, right? Mm -hmm. But the big one is they, well, I like to go to a flip chart or a whiteboard and do that. Every decent web presentation platform has a whiteboard feature. Mm. And you use it exactly the same way you use it in a traditional classroom. It's a way of starting conversations. It's a way of visually engaging people during discussion and brainstorming. And you use it exactly the way you would use it in a classroom. Mm. Again, it requires some multitasking on the part of the instructor. I mean, if I'm trying to lead the discussion, listen to the answers, type it on the whiteboard, and spell correctly, my head will explode. Okay, there are ways around that. You can get other people to write for you. You can have people contribute in the chat, in the chat and 
depending on the platform, you can cut and paste your answers right into the whiteboard from there. If you're using the uh, Skype for Business or Microsoft Teams whiteboard, for example, you can cut and paste from chat and just drop it directly onto the whiteboard. You can do those things. Now, to something that you said earlier, which is what about, you know, when you're learning to drive a car, you have a, a co-pilot. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of these classes by myself because I'm experienced, because the platforms are simple, because the groups are small, and that's not necessarily the right way to do it. When we do our public workshops, for example, which tend to be open enrollment, people from lots of different organizations that are used to using lots of different tools, we almost always have a co-pilot. You can call them a moderator, an assistant, call them whatever you want. But their job, and for the most part, they don't even stay on for the whole class, but they're there to answer questions. People say, I can't hear, you know, I can see the, the screen, but I can't hear what's going on. You know, where was the pre-work? All those questions mm. that we get during classes, don't add to that's the their job. Yeah. Makes right? Sense. And I know that there is some resistance to doing this, and we need to get really honest about the cost of virtual workshops. Mm -hmm. Because if you have one instructor, and that instructor is doing everything, but that instructor knows the platform, is really super experienced, knows the content, literally wrote the book mm -hmm. <laughs> on how to do this, that's okay. In an ideal world, though, you want somebody who will take care of those technical issues while the facilitator focuses on the content. Somebody who can, I very often, for example, Marlene is my usual partner in these classes, Marlene will write on the whiteboard while I lead the discussion. Or she'll be reading the chat and say, Wayne, you know, Miriam had a really good question in the chat. I think we need to address that. So would Marlene also be virtual or would she be oh, yeah. in the same space as you are? Oh, no, no, no. She's online too. Okay. I mean, we're talking now about truly virtual classes yeah. where everybody is connected and logging in and dialing yeah. in from a different location. And this maybe leads to another question. So we're talking now about virtual classrooms or trainings. And I wonder what would be the difference to a virtual meeting or a team workshop? How important is it there to maybe have a video? What is the difference to a video? I'm not sure there is a difference in, mm -hmm. in the great scheme of things. I mean, my thing for virtual meetings is exactly the same as for virtual training, which is, mm -hmm. In a perfect world, what does that look like? What's the level of interactivity? How many people do you want? All of that stuff. Then, given the constraints of working virtually, how can you get as close to that ideal experience as possible? Well, I want to be able to look them in the eye. Okay, everybody on the meeting needs to be on webcam mm -hmm. or is encouraged to be on yeah. webcam. Well, in a meeting, you know, there's lots of discussion and interaction. Okay, so you want to limit the size of the mm -hmm. meeting because the more people, the less interaction. That's Not simple. Same is true if you have 100 people in a seminar room, the level of interaction is going to be very different than if you've got six people around a table. But there you can break them down. You can break them into smaller groups so, and let them discuss Yes, and this is the only thing mm -hmm. that when you're thinking about converting your content or you're thinking about doing some things, there are some different ways to do this. The idea of breaking them up into triads or having one group go into one room and one to another and they do their thing and then they come back, that is probably the major difference mm -hmm. between in-person and online facilitation. There are a couple of things. There are platforms that have breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. And I am going to say something that makes a lot of trainers crazy. Unless you have a group that is used to using that tool, and unless you're going to be using it over a length of time, mm -hmm. like you're doing multiple sessions, it's usually more trouble than it's worth. What makes you say that? 
because by the time you explain to people, you have to log mm -hmm. into the thing, you click here, you do this, it's you can talk to each other. It's more complicated to do it online. And it's frustrating. If people get frustrated, mm -hmm. their brains shut down and they're no longer open to the learning. And by the time they get into the breakout room, they're just like, Ugh, all right, what do we have to do now? And it's actually funny that you're saying this because I just had a conversation with Pam Hamilton and she said the same about physical meetings. Don't let them leave for into a breakout room because it will take so much time for them to get into this new room, to accustom to this new environment, to get back into the flow that it will take way too much time. So don't leave the room. I'm not sure I buy that. I'm a little more confident in my facilitation skills than that. I would not doubt um, her facilitation skills. Uh, no, but certainly I understand what she's saying. The thing is that people understand the dynamics of being in person. When you add the complicated part of the technology, which people are already frustrated and leery about, it makes it a less pleasant and thus a less effective mm -hmm. learning environment. Now, there are workarounds for that. For example, if you're doing a session over time and you say, okay, we've done our learning bit, I've done the lecture component, I've showed you what I want you to do. Now, I want you to work in pairs and come back to our next session with the following information. Mm. Great. Let them go off and do their thing in pairs. So they would meet on a separate Zoom, Skype, whatsoever session and then exactly. come back to the big meeting room. They can come back that afternoon. They can come mm. back the next day, however you schedule this. Mm. This is where I think that the obsession with breakout groups online is because people designed their courses. If you've got a two-day class, mm -hmm. right? We're used to thinking in terms of classes. So you've got a two-day class on presentation skills. And there's going to be some group work. There's going to be some individual work. We break it up a certain way. And people have gone, okay, how do we take that pedagogy? How do we take that coursework? How do we take all that and jam it into the virtual environment so that it's the same thing? Mm -hmm. And I think we need to get past that. Why do we do courses in two days? Because it's a pain in the neck to do it any other way. Mm -hmm. Right. People have to leave their work. They often have to travel. We need a conference room. The logistics are such that let's get them together, cram stuff into their head for two days and then send them back to work. And that's the model that we're used to. Mm. So you would then suggest that translated a two day session into the virtual space would rather translate into several sessions spread over a longer period of time because we don't have this constraint. You don't have the constraint. Mm. So let me give you an example. I have a client who I love, this client. They've been a client for many years. They're in Europe. I'm here in the US. And they want to teach virtual presentation skills, how to deliver mm -hmm. on WebEx. Okay, great. So we have a 90-minute, two-hour introduction session. And then we break them into small groups so that they can practice with the tool and they can do a little bit of presentation on their own and get some coaching. Ideally, I like to do the presentation piece one day mm -hmm. and then give them a couple of days to practice and do whatever. And then each group will meet for two hours and that's the class. Ideally, it should be broken up over a couple of days. This client because they only want to pay a one-day fee, because that's their model, has us do the two-hour session, and then there's a short break, and then the first group does their two-hour session, and the second group does their two-hour session. And basically, Wayne is on camera and online from 11 o'clock at night till 9 the next morning, with time zones being what it is. And it's a nine-hour, however many-hour day. People don't have a chance to practice Mm -hmm. with the tool. They don't have a chance to absorb, for example, we've got plannings and worksheets and things like that. They don't really have a time to absorb them and use them to prepare for their next session. It's just kind of, okay, we crammed two hours of stuff in your head. Now I want you to do as much of it as you remember. 
And I think we have the exact same restriction with physical workshops that we try to cram too many things into our participants' heads. Exactly right. But often we don't have another chance because we need to take advantage of the time being together. Exactly. A lot of the way that workshops are built are built for reasons that have nothing mm -hmm. to do with effective learning. So what would be your favorite exercise then to engage workshop participants? Oh, gosh. Favorite. Uh, it depends on what you're teaching, right? The good old fashioned use a, use a whiteboard or a flip chart to generate discussion at the beginning of the class. Why are you here? The way I always frame it is what's the one thing that you need to get out of this class? Mm. <laughs> right? And then how do you get then through the circle? Or everyone types in something? Or everyone no, turns on the microphone? You, first of all, because virtual classes by nature are generally smaller, you do that very quickly. You're looking at the participant list. You say, Miriam, You've got two lines to introduce yourself, and then what's one thing that you need to get out of this class? And the key to this is that it is both classic mm -hmm. workshop behavior. People understand what they're supposed to do, and it does something really critical, which is it engages and makes people engage verbally and kinesthetically right at the beginning of the class. One of the big challenges with virtual workshops, webinars, virtual meetings, is people join and they're passive and there's all this stuff that happens and then suddenly they are expected to leap into action and engage. Mm -hmm. And they're gone. By that time, they're gone. They've answered their email, they've put the phone on mute, they're answering their email, they're already looking at their next meeting, hoping that this one ends in time. If you engage people in multiple ways. If you get them to actually speak, if you get them to click on a poll or type something in the chat and contribute, once they've engaged, it's easier to keep them engaged. If you allow them to be passive mm -hmm. for any length of time and then expect them to suddenly engage, you're probably going to be disappointed. And I can imagine that the pace of a virtual workshop must be higher than of a physical one because our attention span is so Absolutely. much shorter because the distraction is just higher. As you said, it's so easy to just quickly write just this one email. And that's why when we are designing virtual workshops, we need to keep in mind that it's a different model. Yeah. You know, yes, two days is a lot and you turn on the fire hose and you hope people retain it. But people are used to that dynamic. Mm -hmm. I'm in the room. I'm focused. I'm not going to pull up my computer and start answering email during the class. I might type under the table, but I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> but, you know, we understand the dynamic. It's easier to stay involved because it's more fun, right? Mm -hmm. You're engaging yeah. with live people, which is helpful. And so even though the classic two-day workshop is an optimum, it works on some mm -hmm. level we're missing a lot of those dynamics. So, you know, a two-day, all-day, two-day virtual instructor-led workshop, it's not against the Geneva Convention, but it could be. <laughs> it's just a lot to ask. So, you know, we'll take, if I look at our remote leadership certificate series, which is six modules, mm -hmm. I have been asked, can you come into our company and deliver that face-to-face? Yeah, I can. I don't know why you'd want me to, right? It's First kind of, of all, ironic, it's all right? about being virtual. Yeah, Would you exactly. want people to have that experience so that we understand what we're talking about? Mm. So we need to talk about that. Uh, but also, it's because the modules are designed, they can be spaced out over a reasonable amount of time. Instead of 12 hours or 15 hours of classroom time, you can turn that into six two-hour modules over two weeks. Before we continue the show, let me take a brief moment to thank our sponsor, Session Lab. Are you using Excel or Word to prepare and schedule your workshops? Try something that is designed for facilitators. With an easy-to-use drag-and-drop agenda builder, SessionLab allows you to be free and creative in your workshop process design. 
Session Lab also comes with an immense built-in library of workshop activities and facilitation techniques to help you to find new inspiration for your sessions. Stop messing with spreadsheets and focus on designing engaging workshops. Try it as sessionlab.com. I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't believe in its value myself. I have the feeling that one big success part of a physical workshop is to create this connection between participants right. and this safe space of psychological yes. safety. So how would you create connection, meaningful connection amongst mm -hmm. the participants in a virtual space? It's funny. In a two-hour module, that's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. One of the advantages of spacing it out over time is you see this. For example, when we do our open enrollment leadership series, that's six sessions. The first session, it's kind of awkward and weird, right? Everybody introduces themselves and everybody's really polite. If you can get people to use their webcams, it's certainly easier because people connect mm -hmm. on a visual level. We want to see who we're working with. It takes longer to explain the rules. The, this is how we're going to take questions. We want you to use the chat. Make sure everybody knows how to do that. By session two, though, they already know each other. They've already mm -hmm. had some discussion. They are comfortable using the tool. The webcams go on without being asked. By sessions three, four, or five, they've formed those connections. And it's a combination of the technology, webcams, chat, you know, allowing people to connect on some kind of level. But it's also the facilitation, which is we've built in opportunities for people to get to know each other and to contribute. And so with each session, those connections build. And we know when Mary starts talking, she's going to go on for a while. And, you know, I might not hear from Alice unless I specifically call on her. But people start to get to know each other and you get the little jokes and the teasing yeah. and, you know, oh, you're in Chicago. I'm sorry about the weather. And, you know, mm -hmm. that those kind of things yeah. that happen. But again, you have to encourage people to participate. So how do you do that? Well, I, I think that it needs to be two things. One is the instructor needs to be confident enough in their virtual facilitation skills to focus on their virtual facilitation skills. And you need to be relaxed. You need to build that into your courseware. In, in our leader's guides, for example, we have, after a chunk of information, we'll actually have stop here and check in. Mm -hmm. Or call on somebody you haven't heard from yet. Mm -hmm. Really prescriptive actions in the leader's guide that take the instructor out of their head and go, oh, yeah, that's right. I've got to check in. And You also said that it's up to the facilitator to create this connection because I do understand that over time the participants will feel more comfortable and just by the natural process there will be some sort of mm -hmm. connection. But how can you make this process easier for the participants? Yeah, the problem is that it's more art than science. And again, we do this naturally in the classroom. We smile, we greet them, you know, as... A good classroom instructor is in the teaching space early. They're all set up so that when participants start to arrive, you can have those conversations. Where'd you come in from? How was the traffic? The phatic conversation that we have all the time. I like to be set up in a virtual classroom at least 30 minutes before mm -hmm. class time so that when people start to log in, I can say to them, hey, how you doing? Listen, could you turn your webcam on just to make sure it's working? Yeah. Yeah. Where are you geographically? I'll send everybody who comes in, I send them a quick chat message. Mm. Hey, welcome. Nice to have you. And that accomplishes a couple of things. One is if they respond, I go, okay, they're good with the platform. They know what <laughs> they're doing, mm -hmm. which is important, important information. Yeah. That's less housekeeping I need to do off the top of the class. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is it creates that environment where, you know, if you're in a meeting and you're in your seat and Alice comes in and you go, oh, I owe Alice that piece of data. Alice, I'll get it to you later. Right? You have those conversations. If you encourage that, 
in the classroom or in the, where people are free to chat to each other and say hello and you know they log on early to make sure that everything's working, you create a little more of that environment. Mm. What I just thought was it's easier to engage with the entire group because if everyone comes into the physical space, you can only have one conversation at a time. So if you're right. having a private or uh, so to speak, private conversation with one participant, you are likely to exclude the next one who's coming in. So it's difficult to please everyone. But in this well, virtual again, space... if you have a co-facilitator or somebody else who can do that, right, you're easing your, your burden a little bit. How about workshops where you have half the participants in the physical space and half of the participants who join virtually? The worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely the hardest thing. And one of the most difficult conversations I have with people when they're setting classes up is, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. What is the reason for doing that? And their answer usually is, because that's how we always do it. And I say, okay. <laughs> Or they say, that's how we hold our meetings. And I ask, and how do those go? oh, the people in the room have a great time and the people dialing in sometimes get frustrated and we don't hear from them so much. Aha! So if what you want is to have a consistent learning experience and you want everybody to have equal access to the information and be able to participate equally, why don't you just have everybody online? Um, um, okay. But we do so much out of habit. You know, there are advantages to getting people together when you can get them together, but it makes for more difficult facilitation. You can't use all the tools. For example, if you're going to use polling in mm -hmm. your online tool, it becomes useless if half the people are in the room because you're not hearing from everybody individually. You're not hearing from everybody. It's usually there's a speaker phone in the middle of the room and it's hard for everybody to hear. You're actually making things more difficult. So the question is always, And this is the reason that the title of one of my books is Meet Like You Mean It, because it's like, what is the end goal? What is it you're trying to achieve? If you're trying to achieve that everybody has the same learning experience, that everybody has a chance to participate, that everyone has an equal chance to contribute, you need to set an environment where that's possible. Now, there are things you can do to make those hybrid classrooms or meetings less painful, but you got to work at it right? There are facilitation things like instead of following your eyes and calling on the first person who puts their hand up, start the conversation with the people who are remote so that they get the first chance to contribute. They get a chance to, you know, feel like they're actually part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And to avoid that they get forgotten by the Or, people who are physically there. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. So that's something that you can do. It's not easy to remember in the heat of battle, right? <laughs> When you're looking around and you're looking at faces that want to speak, but you can do that. You can add, one of the things that I like to recommend is that if you're going to do that, have whatever you're using as a meeting platform projected on the wall. So that if people type in the chat or they're on webcam, the rest of the group can at least see them and see their contribution. Yeah. So there are ways you can overcome that. But the question is, is there enough value in doing that that you wouldn't just have everybody at their desk logged on with their webcams so everybody is having the same experience? Mm -hmm. And this leads me to the next question. How do you document a virtual workshop? The simplest way is you hit record. And then nobody will ever watch that. It's like, it's like, but a you know what? How many, minutes on Word. The, how many people read the meeting minutes? <laughs> This is, yeah. Until, until we invent the implant. I just had a discussion on how to document workshops so that the minutes are actually read. So what can we mm -hmm. do in terms of storytelling, in terms of videos, in terms of making them kind of short, crisp and sexy. And I think it's in the easiest way, we can just take pictures of the templates that we produce together, or we can take pictures of the clusters of post-it notes. But all these tools are taken away in a virtual meeting. 
So they're not though. They're not taken away. If you use the whiteboard to capture action items, mm -hmm. you can save that. Mm. Depending on the platform, you can save it as a PDF document or you can save it as a screenshot. Mm -hmm. We use PDF worksheets that go out as pre-work so that people can use it to take notes. They can print them out. They can use them online. They can whatever they want to do. Yeah. At the end of the day, learners need to have access to the information and they have to be motivated to want to use it. Mm -hmm. You can do all the tricks in the world. You can take the snapshots of the post-it notes and you can do that. Anything that you do in a WebEx or a Skype or any of those meetings can be easily captured. Mm -hmm. You can save the file as a PDF and put it in. Some of them load directly to OneNote. So if your team uses OneNote, mm -hmm. this goes back to most of us don't use the tools available to us, mm. right? Skype interacts perfectly, not perfectly, nothing <laughs> interacts perfectly, but it interacts really well with OneNote. Everything you put on the whiteboard, every presentation you upload, every document you share, everything goes to a OneNote document for that meeting. Mm -hmm. And you literally, it's one button. You push that button to make that happen. Now, can you encourage people and make people care enough to go check that? Miriam, if you can teach a workshop and every person in that workshop is motivated to learn, use, and activate all the tools you give them in that workshop, there is a Nobel Prize with your name on it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are restrictions in, uh, in the real world as well. <laughs> of course there are. And the number one restriction is, do people care enough to overcome whatever barriers there are? Yeah. And the exact same thing is true online. Now, if you add the normal, you know, I'm here as a prisoner, I'm doing this because I need the check mark to my name, I'm on the team so I have to be here, and I don't really care, mm. right? And you make it physically uncomfortable and too long and boring and whatever, yeah, people aren't going to buy in. <laughs> not yeah. going to go with it. Yes, that is yeah. correct. Yeah. And you mentioned that it makes sense to practice for six or seven times before you can actually deliver an online training or online workshop that works. Yeah. And I'm going to say something. And there are a whole bunch of trainers listening to this who are going to roll their eyes and spit at the mention of my name. But I'm going to tell you this anyway. Two things about practicing. Number one is find a willing victim who's willing to respond to you, to type in the chat, to answer your questions. So th if you're co-facilitating, you know, present to your partner. But you have to practice it in real time because when you type on the board, there's often lag time mm -hmm. that you're not familiar with. It takes a while for people to respond. The timing is different. The second thing is you need to practice in the tool that you're going to use using the features. Listen to me, my fellow facilitators, and don't look at me like that because you know this is true. Practicing does not mean flipping through the PowerPoint talking to yourself. <laughs> that is not practicing. You know the content. The content is the least of your problems. It's driving while listening to the radio, right? It's being mm -hmm. able to do this while you are pushing buttons and waiting for slides to change. You have to practice using all of the features. If you're going to use a whiteboard as an exercise in your classroom, fire up a whiteboard and start typing so that you get mm. used to the muscle memory of using these tools. Mm. If you're going to use a poll, open every polling tool is slightly different and they all have some step that we all forget. Mm -hmm. And it's usually make the results public. Mm. right? You push the button, the poll comes up, people vote, you can see that, you start talking about it, and they go, I can't see the results. <laughs> Because you missed a step. Mm -hmm. In WebEx, it's two steps. I don't know why they did it that way, but you need to say, yes, I want to share the results, apply. Mm. 
if you're not used to that muscle memory, if you're not used to doing that, you yeah. will forget. And then you'll forget and people will say, I can't see it. And then you start to freak out. And now you're back to being frozen and not your brilliant facilitative self. Very good advice. And there's one more question that I'm very curious. I have the impression that you need more ground rules for an online session. So for instance, when I think of punctuality, Mm -hmm. which is very different across the world, the concept of punctuality. Indeed. I'm German, so <laughs> I'm uh, usually yeah, very much on time and I struggle with the concept of being late. With an online workshop, you have less room for flexibility because usually people have meetings right after Because right. I, I guess they expect, and in a physical space, we always expect workshops to run late, but somehow in the virtual space, we don't. Right. So how do you set ground rules and which ones would you tend to say are the most important ones? Well, I think that ground rules are very important. And one thing that classroom facilitators struggle with moving online is you need to be very prescriptive. Mm -hmm. Do this. Mm -hmm right? Push this button. It, you need to be very prescriptive because you can't see the panicky look on people's faces. You don't know what's going on. And if you don't do that at the beginning, it's going to suck time out of your mm. learning time. And you Take the time the at the beginning mm -hmm. to set the ground rules and do that. Now, again, some of this is culture, mm -hmm. right? Are people used to virtual workshops? Some people still treat virtual workshops as they're not real. One challenge that companies have with virtual workshops is the workshop is full, but at the last minute, there's a lot of last minute cancellations. Oh, my boss called a meeting. I need to be mm -hmm. on this client call. That wouldn't happen, right? If people actually had to leave their desk and go to another location or go to a meeting, mm -hmm. they tend to make that happen. So people still aren't treating the virtual learning experience as a legit learning experience. Mm -hmm or as legitimate a learning mm -hmm. experience. And some of that is the company needs to set that culture. Hey, if you sign up for a workshop and you don't show up, we need to know why. Your boss will get billed for that time, so you jolly well better show up. Mm -hmm. Right? You need to be a little bit more prescriptive. It doesn't mean that the experience needs to be miserable and command and control and horrible. But you need to keep people on the straight and narrow because they don't know any better, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. depending on the culture, there are some companies where virtual workshops are absolutely as legitimate and as valued as in-person workshops. And there are some where people still think, oh, it's a webinar. It's no big deal. Mm -hmm. That said, recording is really helpful. Right? If you miss the first few minutes, you can go view the recording. If they choose not to do that, what are you going to do? But what do you do if people are late anyway? <laughs> right? What do you do? <laughs> you know, again, is it a one-shot class or is it a, what we find is if it's a series, people figure out very early on, oh, I need to be on time for this. Mm -hmm. The first one always starts late. The second one starts a little less late. And by the third one, they run pretty much like clockwork because people understand how this works. Yeah. So what are the ground rules that you would define in session one? Oh, wow. I talk about this a lot in Meet Like You Mean It, not to do a shameless plug, but this is a verbal podcast and it's easier to look at a list, right? Yes. But I think it's really important that the rules are, this is a meeting or this mm -hmm. is a class. I want you to treat it as such. Mm -hmm. I say, this is not one of those put your phone on mute and go answer your email webinars. This is how we are going to take your participation. I'm not going to mute you. If you need to be muted because you've got barking dogs or crying coworkers or whatever <laughs> is going on, that's fine. Unmute and participate. I will be calling on you. Mm. we have this amount of time to accomplish what we need to accomplish. I want you to use the chat. I want you to speak up. And I will call on you by name mm. if I don't hear from you. 
and then we do that really early on. There's lots of stopping and checking in. I do call on people not to embarrass or humiliate them, but to include them. Mm -hmm. And they get the sense, oh, that's how this is going to work. And oh, mm -hmm. he's really serious. How many webinars have you been on? Well, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. And of course, nobody does, because if we don't ask questions, we get to leave. Because, yeah, you said it, but you didn't really set the expectation and build some accountability in there. Final question. If someone wants to start their um, testing period, mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the minimum equipment that they would need? I think it depends on what it is you're teaching and it depends on what you use. I have found that having... WebEx Training Center, Adobe Connect, all that stuff doesn't matter if it's so complicated that neither the trainers nor the participants will <laughs> utilize all those features. Mm -hmm. What I do is I like to use whatever the client uses on a daily basis. So if they use Skype for Business, we'll teach the class on their Skype for Business platform. Mm -hmm. If they're a WebEx house, we'll do it on WebEx because you want to utilize the tools. Even Zoom, I love Zoom for day-to-day -day interactions. Mm -hmm. It's not a great tool for training because it doesn't have a lot of features. I like to be able to upload my content to the server so that you can use the annotation tools. You can check mm -hmm. the notes. You can do some stuff. And if I've just confused people who think that with WebEx or Skype, you just share your PowerPoint slides by sharing your screen, that's part of that 80% use 20% of the features. <laughs> I think there are a few things. You want a whiteboard feature. You want a chat feature. You want something that will make it easy to switch from PowerPoint slides to shared content to the whiteboard. Mm -hmm. A polling feature is nice. Yeah. It's not mandatory, but it's a nice to have. And what I have just described is about 90 of the 120 web facilitation tools out there. So it doesn't matter what you use. If you're using this bare minimum, if you can upload the slides so that you have access, if you can easily change what the audience is seeing, if you have a whiteboard, if you have chat, and recording is lovely, have at it. You've got enough to make it work. Yeah, great. Is there anything that you would like to share that we haven't touched upon? I don't think so. It's been a pretty wide-ranging, fairly rambling discussion, but yeah, I, hope, I, love it. I hope that people take away this simple fact. And, and people that are watching your podcast are those who are already motivated and care, so that helps, mm. right? You know what makes a good learning experience. If you focus on that, you know you need to draw answers out of people. You have to give people a chance to process. You know all these things. Stop being so freaked out about the constraints of the technology and focus on the learning experience. You know that you can't go for 45 minutes and ask for questions and have people really learn it. So stop designing your learning that way. <laughs> right? It's going to be harder on you as the facilitator. You have to learn the platform. You might have to reorganize your content or, or make some changes to the way you do it. But if you focus on what helps people learn first and then think about, okay, given the tools I've got, how do I make that happen? It's going to be a much better experience both for you and the learner. Awesome. Thank you so much for all this information and yeah, guidance. Uh, I, to, I hope to it make was virtual valuable. workshops work. I Love hope it. it was valuable. Of course, people are welcome to reach out, right? Find me on LinkedIn, come to remoteleadershipinstitute.com, drop us a line. You know, we teach this stuff. Uh, <laughs> and I will, so there's help out there. No, no, there is help out there. No need to be frustrated. Um, so I will put everything in the show notes. Excellent. So that the audience can reach out and to learn more from you about how to make virtual workshops work. Excellent. Thank awesome. you so much, Miriam. I appreciate the chance to talk to you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. 
I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day. Thank <laughs> you.